Okay, so uh, so reviewing Dendro here for you. Uh, <clears throat> let's start. There we go. Uh, with the elms. Uh, so the elms seem to be harder to identify um, from just photos. Um, it, it's kind of easy to tell you have an elm, but then telling which elm is much more subtle on photos than it might be face to face, -to -face with the tree. Um, so slippery elm and an American elm, normally you'd grab the leaf, you'd feel for the sandpapery back and top on it and know you've got slippery elm. You can't do that with a photo and unless the photo is real high resolution of the back of the leaf showing you that scabrous surface, which is unlikely, you have to use other features. Uh, so the bark is similar on these two species, the leaves are similar, the fruits are similar, the twigs are going to be your biggest difference other than that leaf texture. Um, and we, we know you can chew the twigs live on the tree and get that snotty texture on slippery elm, um, but you can't do that on a picture. So, uh, so what you want to do is look at the twigs and note that slippery elm is going to have really gray twigs with a black bud. Now that black bud may have a little brown in it, uh, but black is the overriding color there. Whereas American elm is going to have a brown or tan twig with a brown or tan bud. And so that's going to be what you look for there. That bud may have some black on the scales a little bit. Brown's the predominant color. <clears throat> now, when you're looking at those twigs, obviously, slippery elm and American elm do not have wing twigs, whereas winged elm and cedar elm do. And so winged elm and cedar elm are going to be pretty hard to tell apart. You need to use the leaf size, where winged elm has notably longer leaves than cedar elm. Both winged elm and cedar elm, the leaves are going to look like they're about half the width of slippery and American elm. So they're narrower leaves. So that can cue you in that you've got one of them. The wings on the twigs can cue you in that you've got one of them. So then the question is, how the heck do you tell a three inch long leaf apart from a one inch long leaf on a photo? And so what you want to do is just compare it to the twig size. And remember that all these elms are going to have zigzag slender twigs. Um, and so we know these twigs, even with the wings on them, are going to be less than a quarter of an inch wide, typically. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, they're going to be even narrower than that on these twigs that are unwinged. So just look at the twig, look at the leaf on that same photo, kind of get a sense for size. And if the twig looks really big, it's because the leaf is small. That's a cedar elm. Um, if the wing twig looks pretty small, then you're comparing that to the leaf size, that's probably gonna be a winged elm. Yeah, Greg. Uh, doesn't uh, slippery elm have like reddish uh, uh, twigs when they're first forming? It's almost rubra, which is technically red elm, but I have no idea what's red about slippery elm. That's one where the I, name- I swear, I, I saw one at one of my stands and it had like, it had the wings that were like the long and it was, I chewed on it and it was, it was mucusy if, and it- If it had wings, it, had it was red. not a slippery elm. Well- Slippery elm is unwinged on the twigs. Wait, I didn't, I, that was a slip. I didn't mean to say that. Um, okay. It had the, the mucusy texture, but it also had like some new growth foliage that was like red. I, I would not use the coloration of actively expanding leaves, especially when they're real small. Almost, almost all species, when they're flushing, will have leaves that are initially either green or red. Um, they'll be green if chlorophyll is the dominant pigment that it's already picked up. But there are other pigments like xanthophylls uh, that may give it a reddish color as the chlorophyll is building up within that leaf as it's expanding. Well, this wasn't so the leaf. color of actively twigs. flushing tissues is not a helpful ID feature. So like not, if the twigs are red, that wouldn't be. A if it's actively flushing, it's not a helpful okay. ID feature. Yeah. I guess we'll have to figure out what makes it red. It, it's going to be the pigmentation. Uh, it's no, the like same thing backwards from elm. fall color. So with fall color, you start picking up fall color because the chlorophyll degrades revealing other pigments that have been there all along like xanthophyll. Uh, I mean, so you're just seeing that in reverse. The chlorophyll hasn't developed yet. Why it's called red elm. So it's kind of That's weird. not why it's called red elm because all sorts of species do that. I really don't know why it's red elm, but. We'll have to figure it out. Okay, hickories give folks a lot of trouble online. Um, and so people will confuse ashes and hickories uh, remember that the ashes are alternate, the hickories, well, I wrote that backwards, didn't I? Let me go ahead and pick, well, no, it's, this is backwards. It should say ashes are opposite, hickories are alternate, uh, so keep that in mind. 
Um, I think they give people trouble um, because they both have the anastomosing bark, so the bark is forming diamond shapes, um, and they both have pinnately compound leaves. Generally, ashes will have entire leaf margins, so they won't have serrations on the leaf margin, whereas the hickories are going to have serrated leaf margins, so that's another way to tell ashes and hickories apart. Of course, if you've got a nut, it's a hickory, right? Ash has some eras. Um, but then how to tell the, the hickories apart, I think in this format, you need to pay more attention to how many leaflets they have and the nature of the twigs. Um, so mocker nut's going to have seven to nine leaflets. It's going to have Hershey Kiss shaped buds, stout. They'll have deciduous white scales on them. And look for the tomentum, the buzz on both the twig um, and on that rachis. Uh, for shag bark, it's going to be the one of all these hickories that really has five leaflets. So if you see a hickory with five leaflets and those terminal three leaflets are bigger, that's going to be a shag bark. Uh, bitter nut hickory has a lot of leaflets, nine to 11, uh, but look for the sulfur yellow valve bud. That's going to distinguish it from the other hickories more than anything. Also, at a given size, if you have a big tree, so a tree 12 inches or bigger, Bitter nut hickory is going to have the smoothest bark, okay? Um, black hickory is going to look like mocker nut, probably five leaflets, maybe seven leaflets. Seven is going to be most common. The buds will be yellow but with scales, so it'll have yellow buds like bitter nut, but they're going to have scales on them. But look for the really black color to the bark. That's why it's called black hickory, so that's Caryotexana. Um, then I put pecan and water hickory together. Remember, water hickory, Caria aquatica, is also called bitter pecan. These both have a lot of leaflets. They're curved. They're all about the same size. And really, the best way to tell these two trees apart is if you have the fruit. Without the fruit, they're going to be very difficult to discern from one another. And remember, pecans are kind of like hot dogs, and water hickories are kind of like hamburgers in terms of the shape of the fruit. Pecans are long and tubular and water hickory nuts are squashed flat along one axis. Um, I don't have, um, let's see, nutmeg hickory on here. That'd be kind of cruel. Um, but for nutmeg hickory, you're looking for silver glands on the leaves and smooth bark. Uh, but nutmeg hickory is so rare, uh, you, you know. That's, that's the challenge with these image quizzes. You might find more rare species, but if you see a hickory and it looks like someone's dusted it with silver spray paint from far away, that's going to be uh, your nutmeg hickory. <clears throat> maples are surprisingly slightly more different online. Um, people mix up red and Florida maple more. Uh, remember that all the maples are opposite. And then remember to look at the leaf margins. Uh, Florida maple has smoother entire leaf margins. Red maple has serrated leaf margins. Uh, so that's how you'll tell those apart. Box elders compound. Um, and then if you see a, I don't think Japanese maple is even on our list, but if it is, that one's going to be obvious. Um, so I will have people face-to-face -face mistaking red maple and Florida maple. Um, if you see something red on it, especially fall color, that doesn't tell you anything, okay? Look for the serrations on the leaf margins. That's diagnostic. Uh, it's easy to confuse both these with sweet gum, more so online maybe than face-to-face. Um, remember, sweet gum is both alternate and has serrated leaf margins. Sweet gum is usually easier to confuse with Florida maple, so both those will help you avoid making that mistake. <coughs> hornbeam and hop hornbeam may be a little more difficult online. Um, remember, these leaves kind of look like elms. They're doubly serrated. They're about the same shape. Um, they are less asymmetrical, so that's a double negative. They're more symmetrical, okay? Uh, the elm leaves always have that lopsided base. They're really pretty symmetrical for the most time on uh, hornbeam and hop hornbeam. And what you'll notice is ever so slightly where the petiole connects to the base of the leaf, there's going to be a slight heart-shaped indentation on these two species. You do not see that on the elms. That's a subtle but helpful feature. But if you look at anything that has a leaf that resembles an elm at all, and you have a bark photo, pay attention to that bark photo. Uh, that bark photo is going to be critical. Hornbeam has smooth bark that's fluted and muscly. Remember, another common name for it is muscle wood. Hop hornbeam looks like cedars where it peels vertically, whereas elms are going to have flat ridges, more easily confused with sweet gum. 
Um, but there's going to be white corky material somewhere, and the ridges end in a half circle. Not everywhere, but in enough places that it should be obvious. So that's what you look for on the bark to discern these three. The fruits can help you too. Um, remember, all the elms have some eras that look like someone cut off an ant's head. So it's about dime sized or smaller. It's round with the seed right in the middle. And then it's got two little protrusions that looks like the mandible on the ant head. Um, whereas hop hornbeam has hop like clusters of deflated New England footballs. And hornbeam looks like it has a tiny little maple leaf folded around a little tiny nut. Uh, yeah, Stacy. Are you going to post pictures of the fruit with the photos? All, you can find pictures of all of this stuff on the course website. Okay, uh, I didn't know if in the quiz, though, we would get a variety of pictures or if it's just going to be one picture. It, on just about everything, I think it's multiple pictures. Um, the only time you're getting one picture is when it's real obvious what the tree is with one picture. Um, but if I put up a picture of, say, an elm, a hornbeam, or a hop hornbeam leaf, um, and that's sitting there alone, I know that's not enough to ID it. So you're also going to have a picture of a twig or the bark or something else that uh, will make it identifiable to species. I'm giving okay. you these guidelines. These I didn't make these based on the quiz today because honestly, I made the quiz like two weeks ago. I made this two days ago and I don't remember which species are on the quiz. So I'm not trying to give you clues as to what's on the quiz. Uh, this is just my recollections of what was the most common mistakes people were making in the latter half of the spring semester, so. Okay. But yeah, you have multiple you have multiple photos on all species unless one photo is really diagnostic, and where you need sight. So in this format, blue jack oak and laurel oak may be hard to tell apart, right? Um, because they're both unlobed oaks. Um, but the, for stuff like that, we wouldn't make that mistake in the field because laurel oak is a hydric sided species, mesic sided species, whereas uh, blue jack oak is a xeric sighted species. So what I may do there is either give you a picture of the site, so you may have a picture where there's water standing, or you may have a picture of a real xeric looking sandy site with small stunted trees to indicate that it's xeric, or you might get a little textual description saying, hey, there's some blackjack oak and yucca near this, or hey, there's willow oak and um, dwarf palmetto near this. So you would get other indicator species I would give you to key you in what that site is. So that's how that may be handled. Okay, vines. Uh, the biggest surprise I think I got um, with switching to the photo format this spring semester is people could no longer tell grapevines and red bud apart, uh, which I've never seen happen out in the field. So I guess if you just get a leaf, sometimes it can be hard to tell you have a vine. Um, so just look at it closely um, and see if you can figure out if it's a vine or if it's a tree. One good clue, if it has tendrils, it's not a tree. So if you see tendrils, that's definitely going to be a vine. So start thinking of which vine it can be. On those tendrils, summer grape has forked tendrils. Muscadine grape has unforked tendrils. So that's the key distinction between them. If all you have is a grape leaf and the tendrils, that should tell them apart for you, since those are the only two grapes uh, that are on our list. Pepper vine and trumpet creeper have always been hard to tell apart for students in the field. And I think it's because the leaf complexity, you're not looking at it right. So if you look at a pepper vine leaf, which is tripinately compound, and you don't realize it's tripinately compound, it can look like opposite pinnately compound leaves, which is what trumpet creeper has. Um, so when you look at these two, the color is going to be a good way to tell them apart. Pepper vine has really dark green leaves. Trumpet creeper always has yellow green leaves. Um, and then if you can recognize it's tripinate versus just pinnately compound, that'll help you tell them apart because trumpet creeper is opposite and pinnately compound. Um, and then if you have fruit, the fruits are nothing like one another because pepper vines in the grape family. So it has black looking grape like fruits uh, that are real spicy if you eat them. But as those are ripening, they'll be pinkish or reddish or purplish until they're ripe, at which point they're black. Um, whereas trumpet creeper is in the big known Yaceae family. So it looks like it has a legume, but it's round in cross section. Um, so, and it's got really showy flowers on trumpet creeper, not on pepper vine. So there's a number of other key differences. The vine on pepper vine is going to look like a grapevine. Okay. Uh, the vine on trumpet creeper is very tan in color and often grows straight up and down a tree like a poison ivy vine would kind of. It doesn't have the aerial roots, but 
it will grow straight up and down a tree like that. So that's a little bit on vines. Oaks uh, are going to be more tricky in this format. Um, and so as you start looking at the oaks, remember, look for bristle tips to tell if you're in the red oak group or white oak group. Red oaks have bristle tips, white oaks don't. Um, bur oak and white oak have been hard for students to tell apart. Remember that bur oak looks like you took the top half of a leaf from one species, the bottom half from another species, stuck them together, made a new franken leaf, and that's a bur oak leaf. So it's gonna be real deeply lobed, often near the petiole at the basal half of the leaf, the apical half of the leaf, the lobing will be much more shallow. And so look for that difference. They're large. Uh, white oak is more uniformly lobed throughout the entire leaf. So that's a good way to tell them apart. White oak bark gets platy, bur oak, not to the same extent. I didn't put overcup oak on this slide, but overcup oak is gonna be another one that you could confuse with bur or white oak. Of course, if you have a picture of the acorn in there, you won't make that mistake uh, where it has the cap that goes completely over the whole nut. Um, if you have a picture of the site, uh, bur oak and white oak aren't gonna grow on really, really wet sites where the trees might have water lines on them five or 10 feet up, okay? Uh, they can grow on wet sites, but not that wet. That's gonna be over cup oak. But the really good way to tell them apart, over cup oak, the back of the leaf is very white. So if you get something and it's a white oak and there's a photo of the back of the leaf and it's really white, like a sweet bay would be that white, then that's going to be over cup oak. Okay, so looking at the red oaks, uh, southern red oak, cherry bark oak, schumard oak, and nut oak have been difficult for students to tell apart. Um, and so with those, first start looking at how the leaf is lobed. If each of the big main lobes just ends in one bristle tip, that's going to be southern red or cherry bark oak. But if each of the main lobes splits up into multiple smaller lobes with multiple bristle tips at the end, that's going to be schumard or nut all oak. Okay, so use the pattern of the lobing itself. Um, I probably need to fix the southern red oak uh, photos on the dendro site. As we flipped online, I started looking at all this stuff more. Honestly, some of those are probably cherry bark oak, so that's something I need to fix. Um, but Southern Red Oak is going to have a bell-shaped curved base. It's very rounded, so a half circle. Whereas Cherry Bark Oak has a flat, straight base. So that's what you want to do to tell those two leaves apart. With Schumard Oak and Nut All Oak, with those split up lobes, Schumard Oak, they're deeply incised and very symmetrical, and there's going to be a lot of sinuses and a lot of lobes. Nut all oak, it's going to be more lopsided. It's not as symmetrical. There's not going to be as many sinuses. There's not going to be as many lobes. Each of the lobes will still be split up into multiple other lobes, but there's not as many of those main lobes. Um, and so it's just a leaf that doesn't look as symmetrical. So that's what you want to use, more shallowly lobed. Um, blackjack oak, if you were having a really bad day, you could confuse it for southern red oak. But remember, it's just a big old water oak leaf, OK? Uh, thick, waxy, large water oak looking leaf with three lobes at the end. Uh, water willow and laurel oak have always been difficult to tell apart. Water oak's more easy to tell apart from the other two. Um, but with willow and laurel oak, they're very, very similar. But willow is going to have noticeably narrower leaves. Laurel is going to have noticeably wider leaves. Um, and so willow oak from a photo may almost look grass-like in how narrow those leaves are. Uh, and it's going to have a lot of leaves. Laurel oak's not going to have that grass-like appearance because the leaves are wider and broader, um, and it's not going to have quite as many of them as close together. So use that to tell those species apart. I already talked about blue jack oak, how you confuse it with uh, willow oak, laurel oak, but uh, it's going to be on a dry site. So use your site characteristics there. And again, your other unlobed oak is live oak, but remember the edge of the live oak leaf, the margin is revolute. It curls underneath, it cups under. So use that to tell it apart. I didn't put post oak on here. Um, so remember post oak, you're looking for the very cross-shaped lobes. It's in the white oak group. So look for those cruciform or cross-shaped lobing on post oak. And then bottom land post oak would probably be really mean uh, via this format. Uh, but what you would be looking for is some indication you're on a very wet site and you would be looking for cross-shaped lobing on the leaf. Um, so if you see a cross-shaped lobed leaf, assume it's post oak Quercus delata, unless there's some indication you're on a wet site and then it would be bottom line post oak. But Quercus similis would be pretty cruel via this format. 
Okay, uh, the non-oaks in the Fagaceae have also been giving people trouble. Um, and I threw sawtooth oak, I threw one oak in here with these. And I also threw in two of the other oaks, chinkapin oak and chestnut oak. Uh, when I put chestnut oak there, that was just to fit it all in one line. That is swamp chestnut oak, Quercus mishoei. So remember Allegheny chinkapin, Chinese chestnut, sawtooth oak, American beech. They all tend to have long narrow leaves, American beech less so than the other species. They all tend to have very straight parallel veins. Um, all those straight parallel veins generally get out to a bristle at the end edge of the leaf on the leaf margin. So those four are gonna be very similar. So here's some good differences. Look for clustered versus single buds. If you have clustered buds, it's an oak. If you have single buds, it's a chinkapin or a Chinese chestnut, both in that Castania genus, or it's American beech. On chinkapin and Chinese chestnut, the buds look like someone took a little wheat kernel or a little corn kernel and stuck it above the leaf scar, but it's off side, center. It's lopsided. It's not directly over the middle of the leaf scar, like most of the buds that we've seen all semester on all these different species are. Um, the difference between chinkapin and Chinese chestnut Chinkapin, all its leaves are narrow. Chinese chestnut, uh, its leaves are going to be wider, especially in the shade. The shade leaves get really weird, wide. But then with fruits, you're very unlikely to have fruit on chinkapin. Chinkapin gets killed back to ground line by chestnut blight, so it's mostly seen as sapling-sized sprouts, okay? If it's a photo of what looks to be a 20 or 30 foot tall tree with a foot DBH, that is not chinkapin. Okay, um, I'm not going to put up a photo of one of the last remnant chinkapins that has some resistance. Um, so if it looks like a fruit tree, if it looks like it could be a big peach tree, pear tree, fruit tree, apple tree, that's going to be Chinese chestnut. Remember, it has that fruit tree form. And if you get big, spurry, husk porcupine-like fruits, those are going to be the, the cluster of nuts that you get on Chinese chestnut. Now, sawtooth oak has very similar leaves. Look for clustered terminal buds on it okay, or the fact that it has acorns, uh, but remember you have a ton of bristles on the acorn cap on sawtooth oak, uh, so look for that. Sawtooth oak also has very dark bark, but so does Chinese chestnut. American beech should be easier to distinguish from the other three. Look for the cigar or thorn-like buds. Remember it has really long zeppelin-shaped pointy buds? Use those buds. So sawtooth oak has clustered buds, and that's how the, you tell it apart from these other three. Okay, now chinkapin oak and chestnut oak, Quercus michoei, uh, which is our swamp chestnut oak, and Quercus muhlenbergii, which is our chinkapin oak. Those are hard to tell apart in real life. Um, and the trick in real life is you have to find sun leaves uh, because the shade leaves on both these species are very similar. The, the shade leaves on both of them are wide, but if you find the sun leaves on these species, uh, it's gonna be narrow on chinkapin oak and it's gonna be wide on chestnut oak, okay? Um, another subtle feature you can kind of use on these oaks, chinkapin oak, uh, they both have crenate margins, so kind of wavy margins, but on chinkapin oak, it seems to be more like a recurved crenation, so the end of that wavy margin kind of peels forward like a shark fin or something like that, so look for that. If you see the edge of the margin and it's not just nice and rounded, but it's sort of pointed forward like a barb, um, it's probably going to be chinkapin oak and not chestnut oak, so. Those members of the oak family are going to be difficult to discern on photos, so there's some good differences between them. Okay, species with heart-shaped leaves, and this causes a lot of confusion face-to-face -face also. Redbud and catalpa both have smooth margins. Basswood and red mulberry both have serrated margins. So that's how you tell those two groups apart. And then between redbud and catalpa, you have more of a spade-shaped leaf on catalpa. Redbud has a very heart-shaped leaf. But then remember the arrangement. Catalpa and buttonbush are two world species all semester. So if you see three leaves at a node, uh, that's going to be catalpa, not red bud. Basswood and red mulberry both have the serrated margins. Basswood tends to be more spade shaped, um, but it will never be lobed, okay? Whereas with red mulberry, it would be spade shaped or heart shaped, but it's going to be lobed unless it's a really big mulberry, it's gonna be lobed somewhere, okay? Um, of course, if you were live with the tree, you could pluck a leaf off and it, if it exudes a milky white sap, that would be red mulberry. 
So if you see a picture of a serrated, roughly heart-shaped leaf, and then there's the base of the petiole showing some milky sap on it in a photo, that's gonna be a red mulberry. People confuse sassafras and red mulberry more with photos than they do in real life, it seems, because you have that variable lobing. It really does look really different. Red mulberries don't look like mittens, but a simple, easy way to tell them apart, sassafras doesn't have serrated margins. Uh, red mulberry does. So that can help you tell those apart. So none of these trees are related to one another. They just kind of look like one another based on the leaf shape, so. Okay, had a lot of trouble of spe on species that have thorns or prickles, people telling those apart. Uh, people wanna put honey locust for everything, it seems. Um, but hawthorns, Mexican plums, um, and water locusts could be in here as well. Um, I, I didn't put black locust on here, probably should have. Uh, but as you look at these, remember, Honey locust and water locust have the nastiest thorns. They're red when they're new, then they go tannish or gray more usually as they mature, uh, but they're long, they may be branched, they're all over the trunk, they're just nasty. Um, water locust and honey locust, there are only two differences between them. One is the site. So if there's a picture and there's standing water in it, you're on some slough or something, that's gonna be Glodizia aquatica, water locust, not honey locust. Honey locust is the upland species. But the best way to tell them apart morphologically, if you have legumes, that's a key distinction. Remember that the legumes on water locust are only an inch or two long, and they look like a lung. Each one is shaped like a lung. Whereas on honey locust, they're six inches to nine inches long, maybe even a little longer. They're spiraling or helical or maybe curved and banana shaped, but they don't look like a lung at all. They're way too long, okay? So use that. And then remember, if, if you have black locust, I should have put black locust on here, um, it's gonna have paired stipular spines. So they're gonna be sticking out right by the leaf scar in pairs, they don't branch. And they're much shorter. They're not nearly as long as a honey locust or water locust thorn. Um, and so those are all compound leaves, both honey locust and water locust can be pinnate or bipinnately compound, pretty small leaflets. Um, and then you have Hercules club, which is Pinately compound, remember another common name for it is prickly ash, or you have devil's walking stick, which is tripinately compound, huge leaves. Each leaflet's small, like an inch, but put them all together on that big compound leaf and it'll be three to five feet long. Uh, but they'll get prickles on the stem, they'll get prickles on the leaf. So if you see some sort of pointy spiky thing that's actually on a leaf, part of a compound leaf, you know you've got Hercules club or devil's walking stick, look at the other features in there to help tell them apart. Um, if it's got simple leaves, okay, remember you're going to get red, straight, needle-like thorns on hawthorns, Critigus SPP, um, or parsley hawthorn, the only one we did to species. So they don't branch as much, they're skinnier than those honey locust or water locust thorns, and the leaves are not compound. Um, honey locust and water locust and black locust, they all have entire leaf margins, leaflet margins whereas hawthorn doesn't. It's almost always a serrated leaf margin on those species. Um, if you get little red apple looking fruits, tiny apples, pomes, that's gonna be a hawthorn. Um, if you get bark that looks like crepe myrtle, that's gonna be a hawthorn. So lots of good differences with those other species, but people have been missing hawthorn a lot, putting other things, uh, mostly honey locust, I think. Uh, the other thing you wanna look for on the hawthorns is they have the spherical, globose, round, red buds, so look for those. Um, I see this sometimes out in the woods too. People will mistake Mexican plums for river birch. Uh, river birch doesn't have thorns. Mexican plum has thorns. So if you look at it and you're like, ah, it's a river birch, but why does it have thorns? It's a Mexican plum. That's why. Um, and then remember on the leaves, Mexican plum has elliptical or round leaves. River birch has very triangular leaves. So don't, don't mix up river birch and Mexican plum. Okay, some species you really wanna focus on the bark. Some of them, you're not gonna have any trouble with this sugarberry I threw on there. No one's gonna screw up a sugarberry, I don't think. Uh, black cherry, you know, you, you all have trouble with this face to face out in the woods, but really no black cherry bark. It's gonna have gray cornflake like scales that'll have horizontal lenticels on it, like someone's been stabbing it with a steak knife. Um, and then you've got that complex of persimmon, dogwood and rusty black haw where all their bark looks similar, because often you don't have scale in a photo. So you don't know how big the blocks are. Young persimmons will have smaller blocks. They get larger on older persimmons. 
Um, but really what you're looking for there, persimmon has big blocks that look like someone has stuck hardwood lump charcoal to the tree. Those blocks are made up of multiple layers you may be able to see sticking out of the tree. Persimmon is also alternate. Dogwood and rusty black are opposite. So that's another good way to tell them apart. Now you can't feel the bark through a photo to see if it's corky or not. Of course, rusty black haw is the corkier one, but use the color and the appearance. Rusty black haw is gonna stick out more. So it feels corkier, but it also looks like a thicker little block sticking out. Uh, whereas dogwood's gonna look flatter, less three dimensional, uh, but use the color too. Rusty black haw will be bronze to yellow. Dogwood will be grayer in those blocky structures. And then learn the leaves on them. Rusty black haw has dark, shiny green leaves with very noticeably serrated margins and the leaves are really round. Dogwood has more elliptical shaped leaves. They're a lighter colored green and the margins are entire. They don't have any teeth on the margins. So that's how you can tell those apart. Use the opposite leaf on dogwood to tell it apart from the um, alternate leaf on persimmon. And then take a look at Hercules Club and Devil's Walking Stick bark so you don't confuse that. Hercules Club is gray, Devil's Walking Stick is tan. Hercules Club has the raised 3D pyramids with a prickle sticking out. Devil's Walking Stick has a lot of prickles clustered near the big old leaf scars. So there's some differences there. On a twig, Hercules Club will have um, gray twigs with dark black or purple prickles. Devil's Walking Stick has tan twigs with tan prickles. Okay, some of these are just really hard in real life and on photos. White fringe tree gives people a heck of a time in the field and definitely by photos. Um, look at the dark purple base of the petiole where the petiole joins the twig. It's going to be black to dark purple. Looks like it stains the twig. And then remember white fringe trees in the ash family, the oleaceae, it's opposite, but it sucks at it. Uh, so it, it, it misses a lot. So it's what we call sub opposite. So it may look a little alternate. It may look a little opposite. So use that on the twig. This is also the twig where the, the leaf scar is raised and then sunk in. So it looks like uh, shoulder sockets. Uh, so it's got shoulder socket looking leaf scars. Black gum. So black gum is a slightly obovate. So it's slightly wider out by the apex, but close to elliptical uh, leaf. Uh, with an acuminate tip at the end. That's going to be a distinction from persimmon that just has an acute tip on the leaf. But sometimes black gum throws on extra acuminate tips on that apical half of, the, half of the leaf. If you see that, it's a dead giveaway. But remember, black gum is so hard to identify. We were looking at the uh, vascular bundle trace scars within the leaf scar, and it would be three dots inside an oval or a kidney bean. So that's what you want to look for. Elderberry seems to have given people a lot of trouble um, by photos. It gives people trouble in real life. It's a pinnate to bipinnately compound leaf. What you want to look for, most species that are compound may only have stipules where the whole leaf joins the twig. Elderberry is weird. It's got those little like projection-like stipules. Uh, they just look like a little nub on some sort of Nerf toy or something. Uh, but they stick out right at each leaflet joining the rachis. So that's going to be a good way to tell it. And then it's opposite and it's pinnately compound. So opposite compound, six species on our, our lab list all semester. Three of them are ash trees. You know it's not an ash. It doesn't look right for an ash. So you, you really, if you notice it's opposite and it's compound, you're trying to tell elderberry, uh, red buckeye, and box elder apart if it's not an ash. That's it. Uh, red buckeye has palmately compound leaves, so you'll get five or more leaflets sticking out like that. Um, and then on um, Acer Nagundo box elder, its leaves, you know, it kind of looks like poison ivy often. Uh, so you hopefully won't confuse it there. So um, I've already talked a little bit about persimmon. On persimmon, look for the twigs. Look for the black triangular bud. Look for the dark green leaf. You can ID persimmon off the leaf color uh, and the fact that it's that acute tipped elliptical to slightly obovate shaped leaf. Really, persimmons are more elliptical. They're widest at the midpoint of the leaf. Black gums are wider at the apical half of the leaf. There are a few things that have thrown people off more uh, via photos than I would have thought they would. Uh, people are mixing up wax myrtle and eastern baccarus a lot more than I would have thought. Um, wax myrtle has glands on it and it's dark green. Eastern baccarus doesn't have glands on it and it's a paler green color to the leaves. 
Um, if you see a cottony flower on it, that's Eastern Bacchus. Um, so, you know, you can see why people might mistake those. They both have long leaves with serrations at the apical half, but they taper and have kind of a cuneate base, a triangular base, uh, but that's what you want to look for there. Beautyberry is throwing people off a lot more than I thought it would via photos. Um, of course, if you have the fuchsia colored fruits, they're easy, but without those, remember you have an opposite leaf and you have a wavy crenate margin. So you've got that wavy tooth margin with rounded teeth on it. So that's what you want to look for. Um, you'll also have the structures that held the fruits, the peduncles, and so they look like elk antlers. Use that. Uh, dogwood, you know, seems to be even harder on photos than it might be in real life. It, it always throws dendro students off a lot, I think, because it's hard to start learning opposite and alternate. So make sure you look at a, a bunch of photos of dogwood leaves. Know those dogwood leaves. And then, you know, stuff that's rare in the field is no longer rare when you're just randomly pulling images off an image quiz. So you're more likely to see rare species in this format uh, than you would um, in the face-to-face -face format. So remember, silverbell and snowbell have round leaves with wavy, you know, irregular margins. Um, with silverbell, the back of those leaves will be white and fuzzy, or sorry, with snowbell. With snowbell, the back of those leaves will be white and fuzzy and the twig will be fuzzy. With silverbell, you have the winged fruit that looks like a Samara, but really it's a winged droop of all things. Um, you've got that on there, Halicia diptera, Ditera, two wings, two winged silverbell. So look for the winged fruit and then the twigs look like a, a deer's been rubbing on them. They're like peely. So look for the peely twigs on there, not fuzzy like snowbell. Hop tree is the closest leaf we've got all semester to a like three leaf clover. It looks like a clover almost. So um, look for that. And it's got the about inch diameter gray Samaras uh, that are round circles. So look for that. We've already gone over American beech. It's common in some of our SMZs around Texas. It's just, I don't have it on many of our lab sites. So we don't see it much in lab, but we do have them in a fair number of our SMZs around East Texas. Um, Allegheny chinkapin, uh, Castania pumila, uh, that's rare out in the woods, but not on image quiz. Yellow poplar is super common if you go further east from here, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, uh, but it's going to be rare in East Texas. You barely ever find it, but you know, on an image quiz you might. Uh, poison sumac. So we've got three sumacs. Uh, I'm not including um, fragrant or aromatic sumac because it looks like poison ivy, but we've got three sumacs with pinnately compound leaves. So you've got poison sumac, winged sumac, and smooth sumac. And so here's how you tell them apart. If it's got the winged rachis, winged sumac, done. If it doesn't have a winged rachis, it's either poison sumac or smooth sumac. Look at the leaflet margins. If they're smooth, it's poison sumac. If they're serrated, it's smooth sumac. So that's how you tell those apart. Poison sumac's also site specific. You're only gonna find it um, in seeps on sandy sites. So bagel sites. Uh, there's actually a little poison sumac patch uh, in a seep out on the Sandy Creek site that you did the RCW memo on that we normally take students down to see. Madeline Cullens ate it last year for some reason, knowing what it was. but. Uh, those weird bagel species that we only see at Tonkawa, you know, you can find those on image quizzes. Key Huckleberry Lyonia looks like a blueberry or a sparkleberry, but it doesn't have um, a blueberry looking fruit. It has a capsule, like a tiny crepe myrtle fruit, so use that. And then red chokeberry, Aronia pyrifolia, um, that has leaves with a white fuzzy back, fine serrations on it. It's got the red uh, small poem on it. But then remember the key distinction on red chokeberry, it's got silver bark like a cherry, but it's gonna have these rips that form diamond shapes on the bark. So if you see diamond shaped rips uh, on bark, check marks, whatever you wanna call them, that's gonna be red chokeberry. So those are the things that I just came up with about 10 minutes off the top of my head that, you know, maybe things that people were having trouble with on these online quizzes back in the spring semester, but anybody have any questions on Dendro? That was a lot fast, but you all already have the context for that, hopefully, so. Okay, let me stop the recording.